as far as uh, the American population is concerned, um, there are a number of reasons why the East Timor issue should be important. And these, in fact, are the reasons why they know nothing about it, why knowledge about it is, of it is kept from them. Millions of people in the Third World are ruled by ruthless beasts that have killed millions of people. And what has been the criticism on the part of the third world countries, fellow third world countries, has been silent. I'm a pretty tough cookie, but the tears were running down my eyes because I realized that something very, very bad has happened, you see? Portugal in the 1950s is regarded by fellow Europeans as a quaint anachronism. Lisbon is still the hub of an ancient colonial empire, ruled by the tyrant Antonio Salazar. For some Portuguese, the colonial possessions provide wealth, the good life. For everyone, Portugal Ultramarino is a source of national pride. Iniciávamos a escola primária que Portugal, o Portugal inteiro do Minha Timor, era maior do que a Europa inteira. E então tínhamos mesmo uma, um mapa na nossa escola que nos mostrava como as províncias ultramarinas portuguesas, todas juntas com o Portugal europeu, ainda excediam a superfície do continente europeu. The most remote Portuguese colony is 15,000 kilometers from Lisbon. East Timor, isolated by four centuries of Portuguese occupation, is a solitary enclave within the chain of islands that make up the Republic of Indonesia. Half an island that lies just north of Australia. But if Australians knew of East Timor at all, they would have seen it this way. Remember that heavenly trip we did to Timor? Timor. Sounds very foreign and exciting. But don't forget, there were always people around who could speak English, and everywhere we went in the country, they accepted Australian money. There were plenty of shops, as you were so quick to discover. And what about those dancing girls you were so fond of in Timor? You know you're in another country by the whitewashed walls and the Mediterranean style of buildings. And the Portuguese and Timorese ways of life seem to mingle so well together. People were unhappy. Let me remember that when I was 10 years old, 59, a rebellion took place in my country. I was seven years old and I went to the prison to see my father and uh, many people of this rebellion were sent to Angola, were sent to Portugal, to the prisons here, and they started to know also other leading uh, figures of the liberation movements in Africa. By the 1960s, in Mozambique and throughout Portuguese Africa, the empire is threatened by the wind of change. Portuguese conscripts are pressed into the three African colonies where guerrilla armies are challenging colonial rule. Toda a década de 60, início da década de 70, foi dominado por um lado por esta aprendizagem que nós fazíamos de um Portugal que estava a dar a última grande lição ao mundo, a lição da defesa de, de, do Ocidente. For all the modern weapons deployed, Portugal is losing the war. The regime has learned nothing from the colonial experiences of France and Britain. In East Timor, expressions of dissent are quickly silenced. In the capital, Dili, 
the governor oversees a tranquil backwater, a peace underwritten by the oppression of neglect. I wouldn't say that the people in East Timor were starving, but the people were living in a very, very poor conditions. The overwhelming majority of the people in East Timor, they were illiterate. The worldwide upheavals of the 1960s have made no impression here. The economy is primitive, stagnant. The East Timorese are isolated from the world and from their neighbours, Australia and Indonesia. So it has been for centuries. All this will now change. Prendula Vila Morena, Terra da Fraternidad. The empire is about to topple. The 25th of April, 1974, Portuguese officers, liberals, known as the Armed Forces Movement, call their troops onto the streets of Lisbon. By day's end, this coup will become the Carnation Revolution experienced by journalist Adelino Gomes. No dia 25 de abril de manhã, eu soube, eu foi o último susto que eu tive do fascismo. Pensei que a polícia política me vinha prender e a minha mulher eh, pedi à minha mulher para ir eh, espreitar pelo ralo da fechadura. Ela foi espreitar, chegou ao pé de mim e disse: "Só vejo um ombro muito grande." o que significava naquela ideia que se tinha de que um polícia tinha que ser sempre um homem muito forte, que a polícia estava ali à espera. E eu, conformado, disse, bom, vai abrir a porta. Ela foi abrir a porta e era um irmão meu que me vinha avisar e noticiar que Lisboa estava cercada pelos militares e que havia uma revolução, que havia um golpe de Estado. Isso é extremamente difícil. Dizem assim, falta aqui uma câmara de televisão. Eu não tenho palavras pela primeira vez na minha vida como repórter de rádio e como jornalista tive a possibilidade de ouvir as pessoas a falar a sério, a falarem sem feia. E era as pessoas a gritarem ainda no terreiro de passe e depois pela Rua do Ouro até, até ao Carmo, as pessoas a, 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 a gritarem Viva a Liberdade, a Baixa Guerra Colonial. E aqui em Portugal, no fundo, se tentava ver é quem é que tinha mais pressa ainda, às vezes, do que os próprios movimentos de libertação. Que é o primeiro ministro de Portugal Almost overnight, Mozambique, led by Samora Machel, becomes independent of Portugal. The remaining African colonies, too, will soon be celebrating nationhood. Much pain is to follow, but this is the end of the colonial era. In East Timor, the new-look Portuguese have a problem. There is no one to whom they can readily hand over power. The colony is now in the control of a small group of soldiers sent from Lisbon. Their intentions are democratic. Timorese are now being trained to take over in the army and in the administration. A political life is being constructed from the ground up. At the eastern end of the island, in the village of Tiala Toro, they are holding the first ever election for local council. Although he has never himself experienced the democratic poll, this army officer explains how it is done. What's taking place here is virtually an experiment in democracy. The first steps towards decolonization by a new-look administration keen to lift the people out of the shadow of 500 years of colonial rule. 
There were to be two candidates, the old chief, Mr. Fernando Sanchez, who had ruled since 1959, and a new candidate, Mr. Felipe Diaz Quintas, a prominent member of the Independence Party, Fretilin. <laughs> Then the election began, the people coming forward one at a time to drop their pebble into the basket of their choice, hidden from view inside a larger basket. But apart from one informal vote, a dropped pebble that missed both baskets, it was effective and indeed democratic. When the pebbles are counted in Chialatoro and in communities throughout East Timor, the clear winners are the candidates from Fretilin. Unlike its rivals, the coalition called Fretilin takes politics to the people, winning broad support throughout the community. In the beginning, we thought our struggle would not be very difficult if compared to the struggle in Africa. We are a nation in Southeast Asia. There was Australia, just near, a democratic country, a big country, and we thought that Australia would support morally, politically, and so I can say that at the time we were very naive. Timor invites the world to come and see. Unofficial visitors, this group is from Australia, are fated. But the Australian government is busy elsewhere. Prime Minister Whitlam and President Suharto inspect the ancient temples of Borobudur. This is Batik diplomacy. Whitlam plans to realign Australia as a nation acceptable in Southeast Asia, a region dominated by authoritarian regimes. There are now a number of active political parties. The main rival to Fretilin is the Democratic Union of Timor, or UDT. These leading parties make a pact to promote independence for East Timor. Our main aim was to get independence for the country, and then the ideological problem would come later. And so I believe was Fretilin. It was a nationalistic party, and they had people from left wing and right wing. The broadcast from... The pro-Indonesia party is Apadeti, its secretary general, Mr. Azario Suarez. It was he who told us that there had been threats against Apadeti supporters, that they felt particularly threatened by the war slogans that can be seen everywhere in Dili. Once the Indonesians found out that Apodeti has a minimal support, they stepped up their radio propaganda. And their propaganda was based on trying to give Fretlin an image of a left-wing movement. Much of Indonesia's propaganda has been directed against the radical independence party Fretlin. Its secretary general is Mr. Jose Ramos Horta. Well, we are already used to the charge by Antara and the other Indonesian press that we are communists. They always call us as communists, but they never call us as freedom fighters, as nationalists, as Timorese patriots that want to liberate our people from colonialism, from oppression and exploitation. We are nationalists, that's all. The only self-acknowledged communist I could find in the colony is Mr. Luis Jose Abria, a founding member of the Portuguese Communist Party, exiled here in 1927. When I told him of claims of an impending communist takeover, he answered in just one word, bullshit. We went to Jakarta to see President Suharto. Of course, that was impossible. And we saw instead General Mortopo. We had a long talk with him. With him and he was positive when he said that Indonesia would never allow a uh, left-wing government in Timor. And we asked him, what happened if we decide to clean up our backyard. And he said, we'll be watching it very closely. And he put his hand on his eyes. In August 1975, the UDT break the agreement with Fretilin to make a grab for power. This begins a civil war. One 
one of the bad things that happened during the civil war was the mortaring of the unfortunate refugees on the wharves. And to this day, nobody is absolutely sure who was firing those mortar rounds and these unfortunate people. The Timorese army, with its new weapons, joins in on the side of Fretilin in the civil war. The Portuguese administrators withdraw to an offshore island where there is little to do but await orders from Lisbon. Their commander, still titular governor of East Timor, is Colonel Limos Pérez. Sr. Governor, começamos precisamente pela sua presença e do seu governo aqui na ilha do Ataúr. A Frente Lima mantém a bandeira de Portugal no Palácio do Governo. E, portanto, o que é que significa a presença do, do governador português e do elenco governativo aqui nesta ilha onde nada se passa? É, evidentemente, como já pode ter reparado, é impossível, ou pelo menos muito difícil, governar Timor a partir da Ilha do Atouro. Portanto, temos que considerar esta situação como excepcional. A razão básica da permanência aqui é de que o governo português está firmemente disposto a manter as obrigações que tem em relação a Timor e a saída do seu governo representaria, como até já foi especulado aqui na área, a saída, dizia eu, representaria que Portugal abandonaria as suas obrigações em relação a Timor. On the main island, the war is all but over. Agora para Agora eu tenho que ir até para. Oh. Fretlin was a Timorese government. Ketatama, o consulado de Fatim, o consulado de Fatim, Ketatama. You see? They were the only people in power. And they were keeping a pretty tight rein on the place. There was no looting or anything. The place was as clean as a whistle. But all the time, the threat of the Indonesian invasion was hanging over our heads. The army of Timor, Falantil, hastily turns these fresh patriots into fighting men. Although such arms as they have are modern and plentiful, there is no armor, no air support, few trucks, and a fuel shortage. Jose, what's the situation? When did those ships come in? Uh, they start arriving uh, since Monday. Six, seven boats together, very close to our border. No, they're not there just for fun, you know. Uh, they're preparing a massive operation. Quinta-feira, 16 de outubro de 1975. São 15 horas da tarde, a equipa de reportagem da RTP está na povoação de Balibó, próximo da fronteira com o Timor Indonésio. Poucas horas depois, forças anti-fretilin iniciarão um ataque conjugado a Balibó e Maliana. Soldados de segunda linha da fretilin concentram-se na praça de Balibó, na expectativa do ataque iminente. Em Balibó ficaram cinco jornalistas da televisão australiana que ali estavam há uma semana para filmarem ações de fogo. Deixámos-los bem dispostos a beberem cerveja. Tomorrow, the Australian television crew will be captured by Indonesian troops and executed. This is the last report by Greg Shackleton. We were the target of a barrage of questioning from men who know they may die tomorrow and cannot understand why the rest of the world does not care. Why, they ask, are the Indonesians invading us? Why, they ask, if the Indonesians believe that Fretilin is communist, do they not send a delegation to Dili to find out? Why, they ask, are the Australians not helping us? Near the border, at an old Portuguese fort above Balibo, these men await the next Indonesian raiding party. A member of the Fretland Central Committee, Jose Ramos Horta, is here to help foreign journalists report the plight of his country. My main answer was that Australia would not send forces here. That's impossible. However, I said we could ask that Australia raise this fighting at the United Nations. That was possible. At that, the second in charge rose to his feet, exclaimed, Camarada journalist, shook my hand, the rest shook my hand, and we were applauded because we are Australians. That's all they want, for the United Nations to care about what is happening here.
The Falantil try to resist the growing weight of the Indonesian raids. Portugal has abandoned them. Australia is silent. It seems that no nation will stand up for a mere colony. So, on the 28th of November, the East Timorese hastily declare their independence. I stood for over two hours in the broiling sun, listening to the reading of the Constitution. A lot of people were very worried that there might be an Indonesian attack, possibly. But one thing struck me, really struck me, is when the Portuguese flag hit the ground for the first time in over 400 years, because I realized that they put the carpet from under their own feet. They were no longer protected by NATO or Ranzos or anything like that. They were wide open to anybody who would come in and grab them, because there's no such thing as a vacuum of power anywhere in the world. On the 5th of December, President Gerald Ford and Henry Kissinger call on President Suharto in Jakarta. Kissinger has already told Ford that a large invasion force is at this moment closing on Dili. That tomorrow, their hosts intend the final destruction of East Timor. My best friend, whose name I'm not going to mention, said, Sam, you've got 15 minutes to pack up and go, or else, <laughs> or else we'll take it by force. It was a decision of our first government that was formed just before the invasion, that a group of people go overseas to Western Europe, to Africa, to the UN, to rally support for our struggle. So I was sent out. Indonesian paratroops descend on Dili. They capture the only foreign journalist to witness the invasion and execute him. East Timor is now sealed under a shroud of silence. I'm a pretty tough cookie, but the tears were running down my eyes because I realized that something very, very bad has happened, you see? Nós aguentamos rastejados em casa até às 11 horas, quando, tanto os meus irmãos, a minha família, a minha mãe, as minhas irmãs, vieram numa zona onde, tanto os que foram render, os meus primos que foram se render, Portanto, uns eram uh, delegados da UDT, como o Ponciano, o enfermeiro Ponciano, foi, portanto, uh, foi fuzilado juntamente com os outros uh, rapazes. Portanto, cerca de 60 foram fuzilados mesmo naquela uh, manhã. E o sargento viu-nos todos, a levo, a todos levantar, ele não, viu, ele não disse mais nada, só ouvi dizer fogo. E quando ouvi dizer fogo, eu deitei-me logo, pus-me logo no chão. Pus-me no chão e só senti os, to, os corpos a caírem por cima de mim, pareciam folhas, né? A caírem por cima de mim. E acompanhado de gritos, gritos outros a chamarem pela mãe, a esposa, né? E era, era, aquilo era, era mesmo terrível. E eu então deitei-me no chão. E eu fui atingido, então fui na minha mão. Aquilo, a bala entrou e... Saí do outro lado, né? a mão ficou colada logo, eu senti que a mão ficou colada no chão. Eu puxei a mão assim devagarinho, comecei a molhar com o sangue, pus-me na minha pus na, na cara. Pus na cara, molhei toda a cara, fiquei assim deitado, né? fingindo que estava morto. Né? This is only the beginning of a terror that will go on for years. The 1985 report by Amnesty International lists disappearances, torture, murder. Whole villages wiped out in reprisals. The lawless killing of some 50,000 people. For three years, the countryside is shelled and bombed. Then the army forces a massive resettlement of villages. During the famine that must follow, the Indonesian government prevents the arrival of aid. 100,000 people die. Fretland's man in New York is José Ramos Horta. He was one of the handful of young Timorese sent out just before the invasion. We were put in a cramy hotel room near the UN to start the campaign in the Security Council. At this moment, there are over 30,000 Indonesian paratroops and Marines in East Timor. 
this Council must call upon the government of Indonesia to withdraw immediately and unconditionally all its forces from the territory and to seize the air and naval blockade against East Timor. My government urges the visit to East Timor of a fact-finding mission. Further, the Security Council must call on the government of Indonesia and other states to facilitate the entry into the territory of international press. I came here in 75 with some expectations. Neither of the superpowers, Soviet Union and United States, had any real interest at stake in the outcome of the conflict. We managed to have a rare unanimous resolution of the Security Council because the Indonesian actions were a clear-cut violation of the Charter. In his book, A Dangerous Place, Patrick Daniel Monihan, then U.S. ambassador to the U.N., says uh, almost with pride how effectively he uh, thwarted the U.N. actions on Timor. And he was the U.S. permanent representative sitting in the council, voting with resolution, but also he confessed in his book that uh, he had instructions from the State Department to render the U.N. ineffective in whatever it wanted to do on the Timor question. I do not take the view of certain conventional left that everything in the United States is bad. You know, there are a lot of positive uh, institutions. I was one of the great enthusiasts of American system. There seemed to be uh, anarchy, uh, so much freedom of press and expression and so on. Well, it is, in fact, tightly controlled in a very subtle way. A democratic society, in my understanding, is one in which the population becomes informed and active uh, in helping to shape public policy. Uh, now, that's, of course, the opposite of the way elites understand democracy. They understand democracy to be a system in which of elite decision and occasional public ratification, uh, in which the public observes from afar and occasionally says, OK, go ahead and do, do exactly what you're going to do. This wing can't go through that ring. This wing can't go through that one. But if you watch closely, you can see it melt right through. As I said, it's only an illusion. Uh, in a democratic state, where the uh, voice of the people theoretically is heard, uh, it's not sufficient to control behavior. You also have to control what people think. Look. Watch. Can you toss up the cash? Look. Watch. Watch. Okay, George. Remember, guilt is a terrible feeling. And the real question we want to ask is, oh, how do the media carry out the task that uh, Walter Lippmann, the great American journalist, once described as manufacture of consent? So it takes, say, the New York Times, which is the major newspaper, the greatest newspaper of record, and indeed it is. They had fairly substantial reporting of East Timor in 1975. When the invasion took place, the reporting began to drop. Immediately after the invasion, the United States stepped up the flow of arms uh, and continued to do so. In 1977, Indonesia had actually exhausted, come, to, come close to exhausting its military equipment in the war against this uh, country of 700,000 people. So the Carter administration took some time off from its uh, pieties about uh, human rights to uh, substantially increase the flow of arms to Indonesia in the certain knowledge that they would be used to uh, extend and carry through the massacre, which is in fact exactly what happened. As the invasion intensified, in particular as the American arms flow increased to ensure more successful slaughter, uh, reporting dropped to zero. So in 1978, the worst year, uh, there is zero reporting. Because the bombardment destroyed everything. First it all destroyed all the crops, burn all the house. That forced the population to dislocate, move from one place to another. And of course, most of them die of the disease and um, as a direct result of a uh, bombardment. I saw villas completely wiped out. Foi uma uma parte da nossa vontade, aquele ódio que nós vimos, 
é, por eles terem feito muito, muito mal às nossas bebês, tiveram, tiver, fizeram grandes violações às nossas bebês, eu não sei, mataram, fizeram muita coisa, tão, tanto mal, tanto mal, que criou-nos ódio e nós com muita decisão fizemos a, a nossa organização para podermos ajudar os nossos móveis e se nós matamos ou não matamos foi para a nossa defesa pessoal, para a defesa do nosso povo. A história foi feita para nós, nesse caso. O massacre de Timorese teve lugar em aproximadamente o mesmo tempo que os massacres de Pol Pot. Massacres. In, in June 1975, when the Khmer Rouge had killed maybe a few thousand people, the New York Times denounced them for genocide. Great outrage over Pol Pot atrocities, which you could do nothing about, incidentally. No one had any proposal as to what to do about them. On the other hand, total silence and lies uh, about uh, the Timorese atrocities, which you could do a great deal about because we were responsible for them. In fact, all you had to do was call off the hounds. Uh, the end result is that editors know very well what to say and what to think when something like East Timor comes along. Uh, a black light has descended on Timor and we should do something about it. Now, this is for posterity. If it wasn't for Timorese, the Japanese could have very easily occupied Darwin. There were two crack Japanese divisions there. Um, 30,000 men were immobilized by two Australian independent companies. 300 men kept 30,000 men in check. Warily, scouting parties close in on the doomed village. The Japs have no idea of the hot time coming to them. And here it comes. And then the Bungs go in for the kill with flaming spears and fire sticks. It's going to be hot today. Primitive warfare, inspired and guided by white men who have gone back to the primitive. Fleas, lice, dysentery, malaria, hunger, blood and suffering. Of uh, the family of my mother, there's only two survivors. My mother and uh, her sister, who is in Lisbon. The rest of the family were murdered. Uh, by the Japanese because they collaborate with uh, the Australians. That's why it uh, really pisses me off when uh, I see the Australians, uh, what Australian attitude in regard to the problem in Timor. It's a sheer betrayal. Up to two months ago, they had killed more than 600 Japanese for the loss of 17 Australians. Well, you know, Australia has a kind of a debt to Timor. About 40,000 Timorese died protecting a couple hundred Australian commandos during the Second World War. And Australia has responded by supporting the aggression and massacre against Timor. Well, the question is whether Australians feel that that's the way to thank the Timorese for having sacrificed 40,000 people to defend Australians. If they feel that that's fine, if that's their self-image, well, go ahead. In 1986, Richard Wolcott is Australia's representative at the United Nations. At the time of the invasion of East Timor, he was ambassador to Indonesia. I'd like you to comment on one of your cables sent to Canberra in 1975. You said, if and when Indonesia intervenes, act in a way designed to minimise the public impact in Australia and show privately understanding to Indonesia. Well, as you know, we don't uh, comment on uh, uh, confidential advice to governments, but uh, uh, um, if possible that I had uh, put comments like that into a cable, but this would be pretty late in the day, I think, somewhere around about August or, uh, or later in 1975, when uh, it seemed to me, uh, my assessment uh, and the embassy's assessment, not just my assessment, was that uh, Indonesian intervention was more or less inevitable now that a civil war had erupted and we had to look at what the long-term prospects were likely to be. Humans find it extremely difficult to say one thing and believe another. There's even a technical term for it. They try to overcome what's called cognitive dissonance, meaning they try not to lie to themselves. Uh, everyone knows this from their personal lives. So, for example, everyone has done rotten things in their personal lives. But everyone has figured out a way to 
make it appear that that was exactly the right and honorable thing to do in that circumstance. And the same is true when you be in your professional life or your life as a political figure even. Uh, your, the institutional pressures and others compel you to do certain things and see things certain ways. So you internalize it. Uh, through recognition of uh, uh, Indonesian administration over East Timor, it really gives you more leverage. Uh, it enables you to make visits, enables you to talk to the Indonesians directly about it. Uh, uh, if we had uh, not recognized uh, Indonesian sovereignty over East Timor, we would have been the only country in the Southeast Asian region not to do that. And I think we would have um, you know, limited our capacity to to talk to the Indonesians about uh, what is going on in East Timor. The President's visit was organized from the start. The welcome, a mixture of traditional Timorese and Indonesian. There were even cheerleaders to rouse the crowd with Viva Bapak Presiden, long live the President. And there seemed to be more Indonesian flags than people to wave them. And yet the people will tell you that in the hills just behind the town, the fighting is still continuing. Fretland is now fighting a small-scale guerrilla action. Bands of Fretland supporters are being held down by Indonesian troops in the dry, rugged mountains. Indonesia says large numbers of them are giving themselves up, but it admits that the fighting could go on for some time yet. Evidence of Indonesia's development efforts is beginning to show. On top of one of the hills behind Dili, the National Television Network has built a ground station. And with the push of a button, the President brought television to the people of Dili. <laughs> President Suharto told the provincial parliament that the people of East Timor had made a correct and historic decision two years ago. They decided to be reunited with their blood brothers in other territories of the Republic of Indonesia. And in this converted sports hall with its newly installed fans, President Suharto has just told the provincial parliament that development will continue. But he warned that he was not promising any miracle to transform East Timor overnight into an advanced and prosperous region. The urgent matter was to restore peace and order, to end what he called the terrorism by irresponsible elements. <laughs> Assinalaste o rastro da tua passagem Na ponta da minha baioneta Marcarei na história a forma da minha libertação This is Baltiero, a refugee camp on the fringe of Lisbon. Hey, come, come. Over the years, many Timorese passed through here. A diaspora of some 12,000 people in Portugal, Australia or Africa. Fatinella, <laughs> Com maneiras nem representa Timor a nível das Nações Unidas. Tanto a mim como Timor, a mim se ia confiança com a nível Halbo Trumba Timor. E nós nem a colher como em nome pessoal, mas em nome do povo Timor. A guerrilla patrol in the mountains of East Timor. Their resistance continues to deny full control of the island to the army of Indonesia. What's happening now is absolutely fantastic to see a few people fighting a major power. 
which has got a Navy, Air Force, Army, hard vehicles, what have you, with a few automatic rifles. That's practically unheard of. Of course, the ones who are doing the fighting in East Timor, they face death every minute, every hour. I do not face that. Yet, if we were not at the UN or in Lisbon, in Australia, talking about the issue, raising the issue, they would be much more alone. They would be much more isolated than they are already. The people of East Timor are continuing to struggle heroically against the foreign occupation and for the respect of their right to self-determination and independence. We commend the efforts by the Secretary General of the United Nations in the search for a just solution compatible with the true aspirations of the East Timor people. We invite the parties involved, Indonesia in particular, to implement the resolutions of our organization. We warmly... Traditionally, most countries here vote according to regional arrangements. In the question of Timor, we do not have a particular regional group that back us. For instance, on the case of 1982, when the General Assembly discussed the Timor issue, Malcolm Fraser, then Prime Minister of Australia, phoned personally the Prime Ministers of Fiji and Solomon Islands and uh, leaned very heavily on them and uh, managed to get these two countries to vote with Indonesia. So there were outright uh, intervention by another country, by Australia, our neighbor, on behalf of Indonesia. Uh, we've been in fairly regular contact with the Secretary General of the UN on East Timor, and uh, we are certainly well informed of what's taking place, and we continue to support him and encourage him. Well, then, do you think that Australia's recent uh, recognition of Indonesia... Of Australia, delegates entrance, Australia. Recognition of Indonesia's uh, right to... Uh, no, 1979, win. Australia recognize the sovereign claims of uh, of Indonesia well, to East Timor. Listen, I'm not, I'm not here for a polemic, mate. I'm here okay. to get going. You're holding all the traffic up. Make it real quick. Well, does that jeopardize uh, the Secretary General's negotiations? The Secretary General is uh, well aware of our position, has applauded our role, we continue to, and we continue to encourage him. Thank you. Are you going to the hotel? Yeah. I'll see you if you need. When José Ramos Horta hears about the statement by Foreign Minister Bill Hayden, he calls the Australian mission. This is not what we understand is the Secretary's position. If Bill Hayden is saying that the Secretary General supports the fact that uh, Australia has recognized uh, Indonesia's occupation, this is totally beyond the Secretary General's mandate, his capacity. And I believe it's an abuse uh, of the Secretary General's uh, position by Bill Hayden. I wanted to let you know. Uh... Hello? Hello? The question is visibility. To succeed at the UN to remind people of a particular issue, you have to be visible. Just by walking around, by chatting with delegates for one, two minutes, three minutes, it automatically reminds him, reminds her of the existence of a problem. That alone justify the presence of a representative at the UN. Mr. President, we are encouraged by the negotiations between Portugal and Indonesia. However, we feel that nothing of substance can be negotiated without the participation of the representatives of the people of East Timor. Talking to people, and being visible, be reminding them that, that the people of East Timor are still struggling, reminding them that Indonesia is still occupying East Timor illegally, 
and being visible also to the Indonesians. Indonesia has hundreds of diplomats, millions of dollars at their disposal, yet they have not succeeded in deleting the item. My presence at the UN is a constant embarrassment to them. Some members of the international community simply chose to excuse or ignore the type of abuse which is now occurring in East Timor. However, only Indonesia can make us forget, and not by calling us names, but by permitting those Melanesian people to freely decide for themselves who they are and what they want to be. The United Nations has declined to help these twice colonized people. Their new master, Indonesia, is itself a former colony of the Netherlands. The Republic of Indonesia was born on the first wave of anti-colonialism to sweep the third world. Your beloved country is free forever. This declaration of hope is repeated across Africa and Asia as nation after nation is born. The first president of Indonesia, Sukarno, brings the new leaders together at Bandung, Java. Here they create an alternative international forum. It becomes known as the Non-Aligned Movement. At the annual conferences of the Non-Aligned Movement, Indonesia holds its special place of influence. Since the invasion of East Timor, Jakarta is facing a lot of troubles in the international arena. Fretland's coordinator for foreign affairs is Marie Alkatiri, one of the handful from Fretland Central Committee sent out of Timor just before the invasion. Specialist in African affairs is Luis Guterres, who also works out of the Fretland office in Maputo, Mozambique. The government of Mozambique provides educational, financial and political support to the Fretland diplomatic mission. When it was decided by the non-alignment movement, the next summit will be in Arare. The question of opening office in Arare was an urgent matter for Fretlin. We have the answer from the government of Zimbabwe that we can open diplomatic office in Zimbabwe. Jose Ramos Horta is summoned to a strategy meeting at Fretlin head office in suburban Lisbon. We are going to plan a joint strategy aiming at the non-aligned summit. If we succeed in extracting a good reference to Timor, that would strengthen our position when we come to the General Assembly. so they can run on reduced octane. If what you want is leather. New Yorkers have a low altitude, low oxygen training ground of their own. Now on sale for $79.99. stores nationwide and a long tradition of doing business. Your New York, New Jersey, Connecticut AMC Jeep Renault dealers, the right guys. I'd like to remind you once again, you haven't been meeting your obligations to American Express, sir. 
I have been out of the country and I have been able to go through my papers. You know, Mr. Horner, you have only two hang-ups. One, you do not pay your bills. The second one is this. Para a reunião do Comitê 24, para no dia 15 de agosto, virá o professor Anderson da Cornell, virá o Pat Walsh da Austrália, e do Japão virá um académico e um deputado, vem gente, claro, de Portugal e da França, e eu peço para que aceleres o processo do envio do dinheiro para esta reunião, porque senão não posso ir avante com a reunião. Pá. Back on his own beat, José prepares for a hearing before the United Nations Decolonization Committee. On a shoestring, he is gathering witnesses from around the world to testify against Indonesia. Então, se eu, o Sr. Lopes, e se conseguiu-se apenas um bilhete, se o governo angolano paga apenas um bilhete, então o, o, esse bilhete é emitido para o Sr. Lopes, não é? Claro, pá, é isso mesmo, ó Chico. Então, passa o bilhete para o Sr. Lopes, pá, e não me chateie mais, pá, porra. The persistent lobbying and frequent disappointments are over. Today, Jose faces the committee for his summing up. There is a lot of corruption at the United Nations, political corruption, which everyone is responsible, the French, the British, the Americans, the Russians, the Arab bloc, each try to corrupt the UN according to their interests, their objectives. And of course, there are other much more uh, vulgar forms of corruption, like taking money for a vote, you know, to offering aid to a certain country to vote such and such way at the United Nations. These are all part of the system of corruption that prevails at the UN and renders the UN very ineffective. authors of the working paper went about balancing facts and fiction instead of looking into the core of the question and that is the right of the people of East Timor to self-determination. The fiction is the product of a campaign by the government of Indonesia to persuade the rest of the world that it has done wonders for the people of East Timor. The facts of Indonesian continuing military occupation, the continuing brutal war it wages against the people of East Timor, the denial of the East Timorese people's right to self-determination are carefully avoided. We are then forced to engage in a debate between what the Indonesian government has done or has not done in terms of development, education, health, rather than defining a strategy and the means for bringing about the spirit decolonization of East Timor. The working paper prepared by the Secretariat quotes a certain Swedish diplomat, a Mr. Klackenberg. In the Orwellian wall of the Swedish diplomat, the resistance has been crushed. For all intents and purposes, the East Timorese people's right to self determination is no longer an issue. Not even the basic individual human rights since, according to him, this Mr. Klackenberg, he did not see any political persecution in East Timor. Did he expect to see torture and political persecution in a three-day visit? Apparently, Mr. Klackenberg was hoping to have an opportunity to see some exciting scenes out of the year of living dangerously, of troops shooting at innocent passersby just across from his hotel window while he sip a gin. One more straw for you? Very nice. Guterres, Roque Rodriguez, they all know this place. But they don't want to come. They should come. Because they take me for granted. That I, know I always prepare to do the tough jobs. We are not going to Arare to remember what the and to condemn what the Indonesians have done you know, during these years of war in East Timor. The massacres, we have lost about uh, 200,000 people. We have people in prison today. 
but mainly we are going to Zimbabwe to propose a peaceful solution for the question. Yes, uh, please, uh, could you try to put me through to Maputo, Mozambique, to Fratling office, it's 742869, and ask specifically for Mr. Mari Alkatiri. Thank you. Jose does not yet know the outcome of Fretland's push at the non-aligned summit in Harare, Zimbabwe. By now, the deals have all been done. For Marie Alcatiri, Harare is a disappointment, at best a drawn game. Indonesia blocks discussion of East Timor by threatening to boycott the conference at a crucial time for the question of South Africa. But the occupation of East Timor again prevents Indonesia from winning the coveted chairmanship of the non-aligned movement. But the new chairman of the movement, Zimbabwe's Robert Mugabe, gave South Africa top priority. The apartheid regime kills defenseless demonstrators as a matter of routine. Violently uproots and relegates millions of its black citizens to wretched dust bowls. When it comes to European colonialism, as we saw in the 60s, in the 50s, the entire Third World stands up and they criticize Western colonialism. But when there is a colonialism a million times worse than practiced by Western European powers, or humorized abuses perpetrated by third world regimes, almost every other third world country remains silent. And this is an utter hypocrisy that really weakens what could be the strength of the third world, which is its morality. Australia is not a major factor in world affairs like the United States is, but it exists. Uh, it can have an impact. And whether it has an impact or not depends on what Australians do. Just as whether we have an impact, the United States has an impact or not, depends on what Americans do. If they watch passively and choose not to know and choose to disregard it and to focus on the enemy's crimes in the normal fashion, yes, then the slaughter will continue and East Timor will disappear. It might not be terribly effective, but it would be greater loss for us if the UN did not exist. You know, I see it this way. If uh, we win at the UN a resolution, it doesn't mean much. But if we lose it, yes, it is more of a setback, a serious setback. Morally, it's very uh, devastating, you know, very demoralizing to those who are in Timor and still have hopes and illusions about uh, the UN. It is quite important. It has been important for any other liberation movement. The question of East Timor has survived another year on the agenda of the General Assembly. Jose Ramos Horta is off to Geneva to present evidence at the annual hearings of the Human Rights Commission. For the East Timorese, the future remains uncertain. Hi, George, how are you? I'm uh, very busy right now. I'm trying to uh, pack a few things here. Can I call you back in about half hour? Uh, yes, I do have it, yeah. Fucking Indonesian propaganda. Mm -hmm.